We are going to get into it, and we are going to continue with life lessons. And the life lesson that I'm going to be speaking about this morning is simply, simply called standing firm. Stand firm. If you want to take it one step further, stand firm in the fire with faith. Stand firm in the fire with faith. Listen, some of us sitting in here are, are in the middle of a very difficult time. Is anybody in like a, just a struggle right now, having a difficult time? Okay, some of us are coming out of a very difficult time. And then some of us are heading towards a very, very difficult time. Welcome to Life Church. We are here to encourage you and to lift you up this morning. <laughs> but it's a fact. It is a fact. Listen, some people think that when you accept Jesus into your life, which is the best decision that you're ever going to make, that it's just going to be all cupcakes and rainbows and unicorns. I could tell you, let, let me just be real with you. That is absolutely false. Man, I am just full of hope this morning. <laughs> Don't worry, it's coming. It's coming. It's, it's, it's coming. But even Jesus himself said in John 16, in this world, you will have struggles. The struggle is real, okay? But take heart because I have overcome the world. Listen, we're all facing different fires in here this morning. Maybe it's a health fire. You've been struggling with your health. You can't figure out what to do. You can't figure out what's going on, and you're just wanting answers, and you're wanting to get over it. Maybe it's a financial fire. Anybody struggle with those? Am I the only one? Then this church is absolutely perfect. That's amazing. Maybe it's a relational fire. Maybe you're struggling in your relationships, and you can't figure out what in the world is going on. Anybody have any of those in their lives? You can't find the right job. You've been praying and praying. You've been paying your tithe. You've been seeking God, and you're thinking that, you know, everything's supposed to go, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, but you can't even get to A because everything is going wrong, and you don't know why. You can't get the job. Maybe you're doing everything that you're supposed to do, and it's just not happening. Am I the only one who has ever felt like this? It's okay to preach with me, everybody. I mean, if you preach with me, I'll go faster, and we'll get done quicker and beat the Baptist to the buffet. Okay? It's all right. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> That's all right, though. So what do you do when you're in the middle of a fire? What do you do when you're in the middle of the fire? Okay, this is good because we're going to establish a little bit of a foundation, and then we're going to begin to build on this. We have a lot of scriptures today, but they're so important, and they bring context to what we're talking about, so it's important. 1 Peter 1.7 in the New Living Translation says, these trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Faith in the middle of the fire. It produces gold. Faith in the middle of the fire. Peter said that these trials will test your faith and show that your faith is genuine. I want to have a real and genuine faith, a faith that's sometimes hard for people to understand. Do you guys know anybody like that? Their faith is so strong. They've been through so much. And sometimes it's like, why, why are you so nice? Why are you the way that you are? You've dealt with so much tragedy. You've dealt with so much collateral damage in your life, but yet you still love the Lord and serve him and show up every single week. I want to have a faith like that. Yeah. It's hard to understand, right? It's, it's so difficult. We, we can't wrap our mind around it, but guess what? We're not supposed to. That's not our job. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. Listen, I grew up with three older brothers, okay? I was the youngest of four boys. I have a baby sister, uh, so when she came along, I pretty much ceased to exist, all right? So, but I'm the youngest of four boys. And let me tell you what, I was privileged to receive many beatings from my brothers growing up, okay? And even as we got older, we would get into scrapes and scuffles. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you what that does whenever these things happen. I'm talking knock down, drag out, fist flying, blood, teeth missing. That was between us. 
But what do those things do whenever we resolve them in the correct way? It builds a relationship and it forges our relationship together that it's an unbreakable bond because we've been through something together. It's having that friend, that relationship, that aunt, that uncle, that brother, that sister, that best friend who you know no matter what, you may have some scrapes along the way and if you have, that's a good thing because you can learn from it and grow because that relationship produces gold. I remember, uh, I can't remember who said this, but Laura and I were having dinner with a couple and we have been married maybe six, seven years longer than they have. And we said, do you guys, you know, ever, what, what do you guys fight about? And they literally said this. This was so funny. They go, oh, we don't fight about anything. <laughs> and me and Laura were like, that's really too bad <laughs> because you guys don't know each other at all. <laughs> I want to have that relationship where I can trust somebody enough and they can trust me enough to where, guess what? They may speak the truth and grace into my life. I may not like it because the truth is always very freeing, but it can sting a little bit. But through those relationships, those fire-tested relationships, it comes out on the other side as gold. I want to have a relationship like that. And when I get back like, with my brothers, we were the only ones who could beat on each other, Ben, because if somebody else tried to beat on us, it was all four turning on one person. That's the way it should be. I mean, we didn't like beat anybody real bad, but you know, <laughs> we would send a message if we had to as the Skiles boys. <laughs> so we're going to look at a story in the Old Testament, and it's funny how this day has stacked up and how this service has stacked up, and I really do firmly believe in my heart that this is for somebody to hear in here. Um, or, or several people to hear. It's, it's cool how God works these things out. We're going to look at the story in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, about three teenage boys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was a pretty, uh, he was a pretty evil dude. He was like, not a very nice person. <laughs> he wasn't doing nice things. So in this story, he builds a 90-foot-tall statue made of gold that is nine feet wide. 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, made of solid gold. He invites every government leader, every advisor, judge, and magistrate to come to the dedication of this statue. Now get that into your head. 90 feet tall, nine feet wide. I said in the first service, if I had been at this like little gathering, I probably would have had a chisel and tried to chisel some of that gold off for later because if I had to pay some bills or, you know, the camel payment was due or I had to do something crazy like that, it's good to have a little, you know, backup plan, right? So anyways, so he invites all these guys. So we're going to pick up the story there. Here, here's a lot of scriptures, but it's important that we read these. Daniel 3, 4 through 15 in the New Living Translation. Then a herald shouted, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. Long live the king. Sorry, dramatic effect. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay you no, they pay you no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? And a partridge in a pear tree. That's a mouthful of scriptures right there. What God will be able to rescue you from my power? I love this story because in working with students and working with teenagers, I just love their cockiness and their borderline arrogance towards the king. 
Am I the only one that has a teenager? <laughs> they were like, dude, you can build whatever 90 foot tall, nine foot wide gold statue you want. Bro, we're not going to bow down to it. It doesn't matter. We're not, we're not going to do it, okay? And, and that's kind of like that defiant spirit and that defiant attitude that they had. That's what I love in this story. So we're going to look at the three qualities of faith as, as we begin to walk through the rest of this story. And the first quality, write this down if you're taking notes. Number one is faith obeys God instead of following man. Faith obeys God instead of following man. The next scripture, 316 in Daniel says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. I like how kind of they're teasing him and they're kind of putting it in his face that they're not going to bow. So they're teasing him. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Point blank. Straight up. They are cocky. They are arrogant. They have displayed it for everybody to see. And they're like, dude, we don't answer to you. We don't have to explain ourselves to you. Why? Because we do not worship you. And we will not worship anything that you have made period, end of story. Their relationship and faith in God must have been off the charts, right? It's like there was no side prayer meeting. Oh, let's go pray about it for a few minutes to see if we're really making the correct decision. Yeah. Or uh, they, they didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to fast about it. They didn't have to put it on social media and take a poll. They didn't have to go into graphic detail. They just said, no, we're not bowing. We don't worship you. We don't worship anything that you have made. We worship God, period. Genuine faith. Faith obeys God instead of follows man. They did that. They had faith, and that's the thing we have to remember. In the face of certain death, you know, we can, we can talk like we would be all big and bad, like in that moment, oh yeah, I would have done the same thing. Really, would we have? I mean, sometimes this is meant to challenge us a little bit and to get us to take a deeper look into ourselves and into our own faith. Really, would we have done the same thing? Their plan was simple. Obey God no matter what, at all costs. Obey God. Faith obeys God instead of following man. And this is what gets me. And I have to, I have to be careful because there are so many quality leaders, podcasts, uh, YouTube channels, Instagram pages with these phenomenal communicators, phenomenal speakers, and I love every one of them. But sometimes people get so caught up in, I use the example of Pastor Rick. It's just an example, okay? Nobody like come at me after service. But if I could only just get prayed for by Pastor Rick Shelton, then my faith would be restored and renewed and, you know, everything would be okay. I, I think even Pastor Rick would probably agree with me and say the same thing. Right, Pastor Rick? <laughs> it's not about a man. Yes, we have shepherds. We have wise people who, you know, uh, and our pastors lead us and, and they point us in the right direction. But beyond all of that, we're supposed to obey God instead of just simply following a man. Because guess what? If we put our faith in men, you put your faith in me and Pastor Rick and Josh and Ben, whoever is around, you put your faith in men, we're going to fail. We will mess up, but that's why we obey God, because he is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes, even though many times we feel like that he does. Am I the only one who's had that argument with God? God, you got it really wrong. <laughs> it obey, we obey God instead of following men. And listen, it would have been easy to rationalize in that moment for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It would have been easy to say, okay, fellas, let's just... Let's just do a quick little bow, quick little curtsy, and then we'll ask God for forgiveness tomorrow because we're good with him. I think that's the way we really would have handled it. You know what I'm saying? It's like when, when you get so full of faith that where that's not even on the radar, that's not even an option. I'm going to obey God no matter what instead of following any man or what any man makes. But not these fellas. It was never a question. They were willing to stand up for God at all costs. When you follow Christ at all costs, Satan is going to start to hit your blind spots with stuff. He's going to give you opportunities to stand up or to fail. And listen, nobody in here is perfect. We've all been, we've all been baited by Satan. We've all had these situations where, guess what? If, if we can sing about how the goodness of God and there's another in the fire standing next to me, guess what? There is a Satan in hell who's fighting just as hard to get your attention as well. 
And I don't say that to be, you know, weird or kooky or spooky. I say that because it is the truth. And Satan is wise and he is cunning and he knows what can trip you up. He knows what your blind spots are. So you're going to have opportunities to be able to stand up. But we've got to stand firm whenever the tests come. And they will. Like I opened up with, you're either coming out of a difficult time, you're either in the middle of a difficult time, or guess what? You're going to be heading towards a difficult time. It's just the facts of life. Faith obeys God, excuse me, instead of following man. Number two, faith believes in spite of what it sees. Daniel 3.17 says this, if we are thrown, and this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego talking, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And this is cool. This is what I loved what Pastor Matt said earlier during communion. Not only is God able to save us, but he is also willing. Yeah. It's, important, it's important to realize that. It's not just the fact that he can. He can do anything. But he's also willing to do it. Yeah. Isn't that kind of, it, it's kind of overwhelming to think about that. The creator of the universe, the God who made everything, the God of heaven and the God of earth, he is willing to come down and stand beside us in the middle of whatever we're going through. You see, God is able to do anything, but we've got to make our faith rise in order to make him willing. This is important to grab onto this because this is, this is important. Your faith has to rise in order to make God willing, okay? We might get that bad diagnosis, right? We, we might not get that, the greatest news, but it's up to us to have faith in our God who we know is able and willing. But in the end, it's really up to God. And I know that's not great news, but guess what? He is God. I don't understand his ways. He is mysterious. He is perfect. And it's not always about everything that we want specifically. Yeah. Sometimes God's going to give us what we need instead of what we want. Yeah. And it's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to wrap our minds around that. My favorite scripture, bar none in the word, is Ephesians 3.20. God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we ask, think, or imagine but we've got to have faith in the fire in order to make these things happen. Yeah. It's a partnership. You've got, to be, you've got to be willing to meet God halfway. Listen, if you are struggling financially, you can't just sit back and say, God bless me. No, you've got to have some faith in the fire. Guess what? Begin to sell what needs to be sold. Get that job and get out there and make things happen. You move, God moves. You move, God moves. That's when I feel that God begins to bless us. If we remain static and we remain comfortable in our lives, then there's no point in having faith. There's no point in it. Our faith will be tested when we are put in the fire. I told this story earlier. We had moved up, Laura and I, and Slate was just, I think it was like a year old. We had moved up to Fenton and we lived on Eagle Rock Cove right there at 141 and 44 behind what used to be Steak and Shake and Taco Bell. Bless God for Taco Bell. <laughs> so we moved up there, and uh, Laura had a job working at GE Capital for years, um, was doing well. And then all of a sudden, uh, the recession hit, and she went through like three or four rounds of layoffs, like layoff after layoff, until finally, you know, it, it finally came to her, and, and she, got, she got laid off at her job in so we come home and we're talking about it and we, we already had a plan. Like she already had a plan. Laura's the planner in our family. And nobody said anything because you realize I'm not the planner, right? That's not hard to figure out, everybody. So we had a plan and she had a couple months severance. And of course, like the day she comes home, she's already back out there looking for jobs, like nonstop, nonstop. So what do I do uh, in the middle of it all? Here's what I do, Ben. It's like, listen, something needs to, to start to happen here. Something needs to be done. So I go to the nearest Papa John's. I put in an application. I put on the green shirt. I put on the khaki visor. And I start slinging pizzas all around Fenton like nobody's business. And I say that because I had to make something happen. I, had to, I didn't want to sit static and be like, oh, God, just, just bless me. I'm just going to kneel here in your presence. And things are going to begin to happen just by your supernatural power. No. I got up off my booty and I got something done. 
Too many times we, we sit back and we sit static just wanting God to bless us, but we have to move in order to have God move on our behalf. I just don't want to sit there and just be like, oh, man. And God can do supernatural things. I'm not saying that he can't. I went and got that job, and it was the most fun job you could ever have. I mean, how easy is it? You walk up, you smile, you give people hot pizza, and they give you a dynamite tip. If you're nice. <laughs> we have to move. We have to begin to move. But here's what happened. The best part of that story, we get down to the final few days. Laura hasn't got a job yet. So then she goes, like basically on her, one of her last interviews, and she gets a job where she is currently working now. She's been there all that time. But here's the kicker. She's, her starting pay for her job that she, you know, when she first started working there was double the amount what she was making when she ended her last job. Faith in the fire. Faith in the fire. I'm just telling you, like, we, we want all these supernatural things to happen, but we have to be willing to work and put our hands to, to the plow and begin to work and make things happen because when we move, God moves, all right? So faith, uh, it, it believes in spite of what it sees. It didn't look good for us. It wasn't looking good. It was getting down to the nitty-gritty, and we needed, we needed some help. Faith believes in spite of what it sees. Miss Terry, you can come to the piano, please. Make me sound much more spiritual. <laughs> the third and final point is faithful obedience is our responsibility, but the outcome is God's. Good. This is a heavy one because things don't always go our way. Things don't always turn out the way that we want to. And it's heavy. Faithful obedience is our responsibility, but the outcome is God's. It's our job to obey God and be faithful. That's pretty much it. Obey God and be faithful. We're talking about growing our faith and standing firm in the middle of the fire. Because it's so easy to just give up and say, oh, look, look at what's beyond that fence right there. The grass is always greener on the other side. No, not really. Because you'll step over that fence and realize it's just artificial turf. It's not real. The grass is not always greener. Sometimes you have to plant and you have to grow roots and you have to establish a, a, a root system and you just have to say, God, I am not going to be moved. I am going to be unshakable for you. No matter what comes my way, I want to be planted. I want to be grounded. I want to stand firm when things get hot, when the fire starts burning me. I, I want to stand firm because that's where it is refined and it is like gold, the refiner's fire. The rest is up to God, though. How he chooses to play it out and work it out in our lives is completely up to him. He's God. That's his call. It's not, up, it's not up for us to try to figure that out. And sometimes we can drive ourselves crazy trying to figure it out. Why did that happen to me? You know, when Laura and I, before, before we came to this church, we pastored our own church. And we were appointed pastors, and it was, a, it was not a great situation. But in our minds, it was like, we're going we're gonna to rescue this church because that's what God wants us to do. And we weren't looking, it wasn't about self-glory for us. We weren't looking to do anything. We weren't looking to be the ones in charge. We were handed this thing, and we're like, God, these are your people, and we want to do whatever we can to shepherd them and protect them the best that we can. So we had a few people, and we were actually growing. But then we just knew, we just felt God be like, it's time to shut it down. You want to talk about a conversation with God. I was like, God, but Laura and I both felt it. Is that the outcome we wanted, Donna? No, of course not. But the, the, that's not up to me. That's up to God. So you know what I did? We as a family were like, listen, no matter what, we're, we're faithful to God. We knew our time had expired on what we were doing in the church we had been a part of for so long. So the next week, we wound up right here. God has, uh, uh, has ways of working things out that our minds can't even fathom, but we have to go through all these twists and all these turns and all these wrong decisions before we can get to the right decision. 
And sometimes we're like, God, are you there? Are, are you listening to me, God? I feel like I'm being, I'm being tested so much. But what we don't realize is that in a test, the teacher is always silent. He is always silent. Because then at the end of the test, that's when we can get our paper back and be like, okay, here's where you went wrong. Here's where you went right if we're willing to listen to it. The outcome is God's. I don't know what your family struggles have been. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what kind of heartache, what kind of financial struggles you've been through. I don't know anybody's situation in here. But I can tell you this, there is a God who does know. There is a God who cares. There is a God who is not only willing, but he is able to sit right beside you no matter what grief, no matter what tragedy that you have been through. Because he loves you. He cares about you. Mm. 3.18 says this, and I love what Matt said earlier. He's just quoting scripture. And this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if he doesn't, we want to make it very clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Their minds had already been made up. Come life, come death. We're obeying God. True faith. They said, we believe that God is able and he is willing, but even if he doesn't, we just want to make it clear that we will never serve your gods. That's just like a mic drop and walk out right there. We're never going to serve your God. Has anybody ever seen the movie Braveheart? Yes. One of my all-time favorites. The most brutal scene after William Wallace has surrendered himself, essentially, basically, and they're torturing him in the end, and they're just wanting him to say mercy. Mercy. Say mercy. And they had already tortured him quite a bit. And they bend down because he feels like he's getting ready to say something. And what does he say? Freedom. Freedom. It's in his DNA. It was in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's DNA. They were never going to bow. They were never going to worship the gold statue. And they even said, guess what? We're going in. Even if God doesn't rescue us, we're good. So after the defiance, King Nebuchadnezzar was a little hot under the collar. He was pretty ticked off, and he orders that the fire be stoked seven times hotter than it already was. And he ordered that the strongest soldiers uh, to bind the hands of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they would be thrown into the fiery furnace. They are going to die for not bowing down and worshiping this idol. The furnace was actually so hot that the soldiers throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace died. That's crazy, right? Right then and there, I would have been like, there is something not normal going on here. If I was in the, uh, in the army, I would have been like, I'm out, <laughs> okay? I'm heading on down to Culver's and grabbing me a number two. <laughs> Daniel 3, 24 and 25 says this, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Listen. When Jesus hung suspended between heaven and earth on the cross, he had to stand in the fire and he fought for you and me. He went down, he took the, the keys of death, hell, and the cemetery, and he fought for you and me. He stood in the middle of the furnace. And guess what? He's still doing that for us today. And, and, and when I read this story, and I know we've heard it, but what an amazing fire-tested faith that these three teenagers had, standing firm in the midst of certain death and obedience to God. And listen, it's in our hottest moments in the fire when we can feel and sense God the most. If you are brokenhearted, God is near and dear to you. If you are struggling, God is near. 
He wants to stand by you. He wants to stand right next to you and he wants to walk with you. And I've been there because sometimes I've been like, God, are you really there? Do you really care about me? And that's just my own, that, that, that's my own control issues. Am I the only one who has control issues when it comes to these things? We try to control it ourselves, but then we just have to release it and say, God, it's yours. I don't understand it. I completely don't get it, but it is yours and I'm giving it to you because you are God and beside you, there is nobody else. I know for a fact that when times are the hottest and there's fire all around, when I stand in faith and in obedience and then I give the devil no room and trust God with the outcome, that's when I feel God the most. When I'm going through hell on earth, that's when I feel him the most. It's not when everything's going great. That's when it's easy and it's good. But when we're going through something and we, and we begin to lean in and we begin to dive into our word and into our prayer time, because the word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, the word. Even when the outcome is not what I wanted, he's God, he's in charge and it's his outcome. Faith obeys God instead of following man. Faith believes in spite of what it sees. It might not look good. You might not know what's going to happen, but you have to step out on faith. You have to begin to live that out in your everyday life. Faithful obedience is up to us, but the outcome is God's. The outcome might not be exactly what you wanted. We may not understand it. But guess what? We still have to continue to show up. We can't abandon our faith in a time like that because that's when God could just be coming the most real to you than you ever thought he could be. Yeah, it might have to come through a tragedy. It might have to come through a, a trial and a circumstance, but guess what? You can look back and be like, God, I don't understand it, but man, this is when I really begin to cling to you. This is when I begin to understand the power of who you are and what you could mean to me. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. Listen, when I get on an airplane, I don't want to see some pilot that looks 10 years younger than me. I'm like, this dude has probably flown two flights in his entire life. I want to see a dude that looks like Sully, the dude that landed on the Hudson River, you know? I want to see somebody who's been tested somebody who's been through the fire, who knows every situation that's gonna happen. And in God, he knows what's gonna happen. And when we step in and we lean in, that's when God really blesses us. And that's when he becomes real to us. Can you stand on your feet and bow your heads with me? God, you are good.